2 Chronicles chapter 32, starting in verse 1. This is the story of King Hezekiah. He was dealing with an invasion from Assyria, the enemy of God that had been used by God to judge Judah and Israel. Babylon was also used because of Israel's constant rebellion, falling into sin, repenting, then rebellion and falling into sin. Second Chronicles chapter 32 verse 1, it reads here, after Hezekiah had faithfully carried out this work, King Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified towns, giving orders for his army to break through their walls. When Hezekiah realized that Sennacherib had also intended to attack Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military advisors, and they decided to stop the flow. Look at your neighbor and tell him, stop the flow. Look at your other neighbor, tell him, stop the flow. Stop the flow of the springs outside the city. They organized a huge work crew to stop the flow of the springs, cutting off the brook that ran through the fields. For they said, why should the kings of Assyria come here and find plenty of water? Then Hezekiah worked hard. Look at your neighbor. Tell him he worked hard. He put some work in. At repairing all of the broken sections of the wall, erecting towers and constructing a second wall outside the first. He also reinforced the supporting terraces in the city of David and manufactured large numbers of weapons and shields. Look at your neighbor and tell him weapons and shields. Look at your other neighbor and say, I need some weapons and I need some shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate. Then Hezekiah encouraged them by saying, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria or his mighty army, for there is a power far greater on our side. He may have a great army, but they are merely men. I thank God for it. We have the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles for us. And Hezekiah's words greatly encouraged the people. I want to title my sharing today. I want to title it, Stop the Flow. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the few moments that we have to eat upon your word. I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for the word of God, sharp, dividing soul, spirit, bone, and marrow, doing surgery on our heart that we would walk with you at a greater level. God, this is an hour where we must battle. We must have boundaries and we must be bold. I thank you today for your people. I bind every spirit that would come to confuse and divide and distract. And I pray for the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit to give interpretation for our lives, to apply exactly what you want to do in us today. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said together, amen. I'm just going to share for a few moments. Uh, I want to say this as a disclaimer in the beginning. Uh, a lot of what I share today really is a shameless plug for many of you to sign up for the missing ingredient when you leave this room, the missing ingredient. How many of you have not signed up for the missing Just be honest in the church, have not signed up for the missing ingredient. I want to encourage you. God wants to do a good, good work on the inside of us. As I read the story of King Hezekiah's resistance against the Assyrian king, uh, some deep truths and nuggets contained in this record of Hezekiah's journey really began to come forth for me. They boil down to one simple truth that we must have working in our lives if we're to be successful. The enemy of our souls wants to cause us to be confused. Hezekiah realized that King Sennacherib was the enemy. That point right there, for many of us, may be rhema for us today because there may be many of us in the room that you have people in your lives, you have situations in your lives, you have habits and addictions that you actually, in your mind and in your heart, the flow of all of your energy is going toward that thing. 
And there is a confusion in the culture and even a confusion in the church uh, because many times we believe that we must be nice and we must be cordial, which is all true. Uh, but my Bible reads that Hezekiah, when he realized who his enemy was, he went to work to stop what would have brought nourishment and energy and refreshment to the enemy. I wonder how many in the room have things and people and situations in their lives where you have a flow of your energy and your resources and your time to someone that actually or something that actually has plans to destroy you. Matthew 7, 6 says, don't waste what is holy on people who are holy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. I remember the scripture where Jesus was brought to the edge of a cliff. The people hated him. And he didn't try to bargain with them. He didn't try to convince them to like him. He simply walked through them and left. Some of us are trying to bargain and negotiate and be in alliance with a spirit, a person, a situation, a habit that you must simply walk through and leave. Now, I'm I want to clarify that. That is not marriage. We don't do that in marriage. But there are situations where we have not laid down and understood that I'm dealing with an enemy spirit. Healthy boundaries are critical in our lives because many of us, like Hezekiah, even though we're saved and striving to live holy, we, need to, we have taken down the high places in our lives. We've begun flipping the pages. We have areas of our lives that we're watering and feeding, but yet subconsciously cultivating our enemies because of fear, because of low self-esteem, because of codependent tendencies, because of deeply rooted wrong beliefs about ourselves, self-sabotaging behaviors, and a people-pleasing spirit of rejection. We just want to please people. You know, the fastest growing church right now in the world is the Iranian church. I was reading an article about the Iranian church and it said this, that there is a big difference that church has learned because there's a lot of persecution, uh, even some martyrdom having people are giving up their lives for Christ right now. I told the kids, there's a practice right now in certain parts of the world where even children that love Jesus are being put up on crosses. But the whole point of the article was this, that they have found that converts will run, but disciples will stand. And we need to live in an hour where we understand the warfare. Hezekiah, whose name means to strengthen or fortify, was the son of King Ahaz and the 13th king of Judah, who reigned from 715 to 686 B.C., beginning when he was just 25 years old. 2 Kings 18.4 records the two-step process that King Hezekiah took uh, the land of Judah through the first 14 years of his reign. Write this down, point number one. He removed all the high places. He removed all the high places. These high places were built as places of idol worship and the worship of false gods, little g. They were sacred pillars and wooden images used in the worship of Baal, the male sun god, and Asherah, or Ashtoreth, the female moon goddess. The establishment of these high places all around the land of Judah introduced the practice of ritual prostitution and illicit sex as part of the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth. The high places established in Judah before Hezekiah's reign represented the peer pressure type pull of surrounding nations on the people of God, tempting them to fit in, to intermarry and practice sinful lifestyles and behaviors forbidden by, by God. Somebody say people, places, and things. He brought down the high places. Many of us in the room have gone through the process of taking down the high places in our lives. 
Many of us in the room have gone through the processes of removing addictions, going to an encounter, and, and, and having things cleansed out of our life. This is the process King Hezekiah did in the land of Judah. We represent that land that God is taking through a process of removing idolatry out of the heart of. Point number two, he destroyed the bronze serpent. Write that down. He destroyed the bronze serpent. That bronze serpent called Nehushtan was made by Moses in Numbers 21.4. That was when the children of Israel began to pl complain against God in the wilderness and were bitten by fiery snakes sent by God as judgment. Moses prayed for the people and was instructed by God to make the bronze serpent and place it on a pole. Everyone who looked at the bronze serpent was healed. That same bronze serpent over time became an idol that the people of Judah began to worship because of the influence of the world and they saw snakes as fertility symbols. Let's say that right there. The, the bronze serpent is a picture of a dead church. The bronze serpent is a picture of the people of Judah beginning to worship the form that represented healing instead of the God who was the originator of the healing. I want to say it again. The bronze serpent represented healing and the form of healing instead of the God who was the essence of healing. In other words, are you worshiping the church? Are you coming to church? Are you worshiping the God of the church? This is why we can sit in churches year after year. This is why I could sit in church, have an issue with pornography and sit in that church for years and never get healed. This is why we can sit for years in a place and go through the form, go through the motions, go through worshiping, singing, raising our hands, and at the same time never be changed. I don't know about you, but what happened in the lives of our young people on the inside this weekend has caused me to take a look at my own self. Let's keep moving. According to 1 Corinthians 10.20, the sacrifices made to Baal and Astra is really plain and simple, the worship of demonic spirits. So we see the people of Judah at the time of Hezekiah becoming king caught in a vicious cycle of idol worship, punishment, restoration, forgiveness. Idol worship, punishment, restoration, and forgiveness. Sin, habits, addictions, punishment, idol worship, and forgiveness. The children of Israel went in the circle, that circle continually. And Assyria was one of the pagan nations along with Babylon in the Old Testament that God used against his people as judgment for their disobedience. The king of Assyria sent a cherub at the time of Hezekiah became king, began collecting money from Judah as a tribute for what was going on in the land. Some of you have made a stand and said, I'm cutting off all these ungodly alliances where I'm paying tribute to the enemy. I'm drawing a line in the stand. Just because you pay a bill or two doesn't mean I'm going to open up to you. Just because you have a friendship with me doesn't mean I'm going to give you access to my most valuable secrets and sacred parts of my life and compromise a holy lifestyle and, and compromise my purity and my morals and my character, to character. Remember Esau and Jacob. Esau was willing to surrender the most valuable asset he owned his birthright as firstborn son with access to all his father's inheritance for a cup of soup. He was hungry. He was horny. He had needs. What is it that, you, that you're hungry for that you're giving up your whole inheritance? for a cup of soup, for a quick fix. The discipleship process is a process of cleansing that took 14 years in the land of Judah. 
Titus 2.12 in the New International Version says this, the Word of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Look at your neighbor and tell them, I need to say no. <laughs> Look at your other neighbor and tell them, there's some things I just need to say no to. I wonder how many of us in this process have experienced the backlash from the enemy of our souls when we finally got sick and tired of our lives being out of order and aligned with the enemy and we finally put our foot down and told the enemy, no. I'm moving. There's three processes for building healthy boundaries in our lives. Point number one. Rebuild the broken walls. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. I've learned this year that there are people in our life that are going to either help us or there are people in our life that are going to hurt us. I learned it this year that there are situations in my life that I can miss it and think someone or something is helping me when it's actually hurting me. As a man and a woman of God, we need to get to the point where we understand very clearly who in our life is a friend and who in our life is a foe. See, we can spend years and years and years flowing water and energy and resources and love an abundance of gifts on a situation that is nothing but death. I preached a message a few months ago. You're looking for Christ in dead places. You're thinking something's going to give something back to you, and you're, keeping, you're pouring all of your best years of your life into something that is not going to give back to you. I know it's tight. I want to say this by the Spirit. Some of your friends are your enemies. Some of the people in this room. Some of us are connected to people that are killing us softly. Point number two, build weapons and shields. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says this, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know what I found in my life? There are areas that I can think are right, But when I get in an encounter, when I get in the presence of the Lord, when the spirit of truth comes to me, God can begin to give me discernment and say, hold up a minute, let me back up. There's something wrong with this picture. You can be in a job situation where you've been serving for 15, 20 years. And some of you even in the room have backed up and said, hold on a minute. You can be connected to a friend. And if you'll back up for a minute and ask the Lord to speak to you, he may begin to tell you and show you things about that person. And I'm not trying to sabotage real friendships. Don't misunderstand me. Don't question the people you know that love you and in covenant with you. I'm talking about some of us have one person that can destroy the whole vine. (laughs) 
stop the flow. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, stop the flow. Stop the flow. Build weapons. Build shields. We're talking about building weapons and shields. Accountability. It's a shield. This man of God will call me at 11 p.m. at night. And if I don't answer the phone, who have you given permission to call you and ask you, what are you doing and where are you? I'm telling you, it's a war out here. You better have some weapons and you better have some shields. Another weapon, discipleship. Anybody remember Karate Kid? Mr. Miyagi, walk on the right side, safe. Walk on the left side, safe. Walk down the middle of the road, squish like a grape. Karate do, do you, you do, yes. Karate do, no. You guess so, and you squish like a grape. You guess so. If you're lukewarm about being a part of discipleship process, Mr. Miyagi said, it is a sacred vow for me to disciple you. I guess so. You squish like a grape. King Sennacherib was poised to destroy Jerusalem. Destroy it. And the king understood this ain't no time to play around. This church is no time, listen to me in the spirit, to play around with your soul. The scripture says, what profits a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. Number three, verse five of Second Chronicles 32, repair the Milo. I'm about to close, but this is my last point. Repair the Milo. Milo, help me Holy Ghost, was the place in Jerusalem that was a place that was built up much like a levee. And we know about in floods, there's, there, there are levees built so the water doesn't rush over when they're flooding and drown the whole city. Milo was that levee, that inside place right near David's palace, inside of the city of Jerusalem, that King Hezekiah, interesting enough, was recorded that they had to repair the Milo, the inside place, the inside place. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you, you want to look good. You, you love walking around and reading scriptures and saying long prayers and having honor in the city. But you're like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones. Uh, your heart's sick. Your heart wounded. Proverbs 13, 12 says this, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Y'all, this year I didn't realize how sick I was. I stood at that cross and nailed nail after nail at the men's encounter. As God showed me the enemies that I had befriended in my life. That I had become comfortable with. Like unforgiveness. Like low self-esteem, like thinking I'm not good enough, thinking it's okay for me to walk around at this level, thinking that I'm not good enough, woman and man of God. What? 
When God says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made that I'm more than a conqueror in Christ, neither life nor death nor principalities nor powers are able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I was in unbelief. I didn't believe him. This year, I started to a business where um, we manage different homes, and part of the process, actually this last month, was renovating an old house. And my business partner told me, you know, newer houses are one thing, but old houses that have been around for a while and have gone through some life, some of you in the room have gone through some life. When you start to make a budget for an old home and decide I'm going to fix that and fix this and go in the basement and deal with that and you come up with a budget said you got to be careful because you're going to find things when you try to renovate an old home. First step was hauling away the junk. I went in this house, it smelled so nasty, I didn't want to stay in there five minutes. There was stuff that had been hoarded, stuff that was junk, stuff that was piled up, stuff that was rotten, all up in the house. House on Brookside, it looked nice on the outside. And many of us have become like spiritual Hoarders, we have things piled up in the back room. Listen to me, woman of God. We have things piled up in our lives that we don't want people to touch. I remember that show, Hoarders, a woman sitting there weeping over old National Geographic magazines that she didn't want anybody to touch. Look at your neighbor, tell him, are you a spiritual hoarder? Do you have attachments and grief that are all up in your closets, all up in your attic, all up in your basement of your life? Number two, demolition. Boy, this one really got me. When God begins to renovate our house and he wants to put new things in and, and build new cabinets and put a new bathroom in and uh, marble countertops and the nicest chandeliers and beautiful crown molding. We had to tear some stuff out before we put the new stuff in. And I'm telling you, men and women of God, when we began to tear some old cabinets out, I looked up and I saw holes where termites had eaten the whole wall away. Some of us in our life, it's hidden. But when we allow God to begin to do the demolition, and I sent some of the folks from the church, they were over there swinging hammers and had chisels and were breaking stuff up. And when God wants to do a renovation in our life, trust me, sometimes it's a little bit painful and it's sometimes it's a little uncomfortable. And why are you chiseling on that? And why are you pulling that out? And why are you ripping that out? But beneath and underneath and in the basement, there were areas where there were things rotting that needed to be torn out. The scripture says, beware of yeast. Because a little bit will contaminate the whole loaf of bread. I wonder if the Lord today wants to deal with some hidden places of our life, our Milo, the inside place that he wants to repair. Last thing I want to share about the renovation process, and I'm done. If we are not connected, one of the things that I um, happened a couple of weeks ago, I would kept trying to turn this light on, and then I my little plug-in, Glade plug-in that Pastor got me putting in my apartment now, is everything has to smell beautiful, right? I, I, I started realizing, hey, it's not working. I don't smell anything when I come in my apartment. 
And as I began to examine, I realized there was no connection. Somehow the breaker had been tripped. Somehow the power was not getting to the receptacle and there was nothing happening. Some of us in our lives are wondering, why isn't anything happening? Why is there no aroma and fragrance? I'm getting nervous as I step back and examine my life because there's, I don't, I don't, I don't smell the aroma. I have lost, I had the aroma a few weeks ago. Now I walk in the house and I don't, I don't smell it anymore. The electrician came to the house we're remodeling and said, look, I'm licensed. I'm licensed. And you've got some old knob and tube. Anybody know what knob and tube is in the house? I got some old, there's some old wires that are frayed. It's old technology. I can't even touch it. He said, but if I am allowed to come in and work on this house, I need to replace every bit of that knob and tube because it's old it's out of date, it's frayed, it's broken, and it's a fire hazard. Can I minister to you all, people of God, that some of us, myself included, have some areas of our life that if we don't allow the Holy Ghost, the one that controls all power, to correct and replace the wiring of our life. See, the problem is if I go in and renovate the whole house, put all this beautiful stuff in, and the wiring is still faulty, the liability, because I can drive up and that house will be totally burned to the ground. We have areas of our life, and I'm finishing, we have areas of our life Psychologists say, tell us that when we even hear abuse in the next room, it begins to rewire our brain. And counselors will tell us that when we have that rewiring, when we're abused, when we're molested, when we have situations called trauma in our life, when we have PTSD and we go through situations that we were never created to go through, it just begins to rewire like old knob and tube all up in our brain and we can't think, we got brain fog, we're not sleeping right, we're cussing out our kids, we're angry, we got all this stuff going on. And God is wanting to deal and repair the Milo, the inside part of our heart. The city of David, Judah, the lineage from which Christ came from, that's you. And your heart is critical. It's critical that we get the wires repaired. Some of you in the room, even right now, the confusion is confused. You just can't think right. This is something I went through the last few years. Can't, can't concentrate, can't focus, can't sit down and read the word for any length of time because I'm just all over the place. And I thank God that the one that repairs us is not some earthly electrician or some earthly contractor that gets there late and leaves early and tools are not in order. The one that we serve is one that loves us and he knows our end from our beginning. I don't want to drag it out, but some of you in the room, there are some very, very, very foundational issues that are killing us softly and King Hezekiah had enough discernment to step back King Sennacherib further down in that portion of scripture was operating in a spirit of fear and intimidation and he was pointing at them saying I conquered every other land around y'all and I'm about to whoop your 
And many of you have situations surrounding you right now in your life. And the Holy Spirit sent me this morning to maybe remind you, are there, is there an enemy? Is there someone or something or a place that is getting ready to attack you? You got your life in order. And after King Hezekiah got the land in order, took down the high places, destroyed the bronze serpent, then here comes the enemy. And I prayed this morning that those that God needed to respond to this word would have the strength. The word Hezekiah, the name Hezekiah means God will fortify. God, well, I don't have to. See, we think that we have to do it. But part of Hezekiah's first action was to say, I got to stop all this mess. I got to stop giving place to the enemy, acting like this person, this thing, this situation is my friend, and decide and realize and discern in my heart and my mind that this is an enemy. This is a weapon that is being used against me. This person has become a weapon. Listen to me. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I bind every spirit of confusion in the name of Jesus. I bind anything that would resist true repentance in the house. And God, would you loose your Holy Spirit? God, just to make us free. I thank you that your word says that he who the Son has set free is free indeed, Lord God. Thank you that you can give us peace that passes all understanding. You said that the government shall be upon your shoulders. Oh, my God, you want to take care of our mind that it will begin to govern our life. But God, do the repairing. Begin the process. God, those in the room, even if they don't come to the altar, I pray they'd walk out and sign up for the missing ingredient. Because there's some stuff that's missing in our life. And the aroma has left. The power, there's no connection. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to help us this morning. There is a balm in Gilead. I was telling the kids the other day I was born in Korea, was an orphan, stayed in an orphanage for about a year, then was in a foster home. was adopted, didn't know my father for 45 years. Three years ago, I met him. For many decades, the spirit of rejection had me by the neck. The spirit of abandonment had me by the neck. I wasn't strong enough to put up boundaries because of what I was lacking. And I thank God today, I'm going to close in prayer, but there are those in the room. Again, I meant what I said. Some of us need to go ahead and get the book and sign up. And some of us need to begin to rightfully connect ourselves and get some swords and some weapons and some shields in our life because the enemy is wreaking havoc right now and you know who you are the Lord is gentle he's not going to force us to do anything but I pray by the mercies of God that the truth of the Lord would set us free today would you stand to your feet the altars are still open ma'am I don't know you This is not intended to embarrass in any way. Yes. But God just wants to tell you that he loves you, that his plan for you has never shifted.
to the right or to the left. His thoughts for you, the Bible says there is no shadow of turning in him. He doesn't change his mind. What he told you back then is true today. Regardless of what has happened with your family and regardless of the disappointments and the failures and the situations that would have caused you to be discouraged and to give up and just kind of exist. Oh, my God. He says that your latter days are going to be greater and the renovation that he's been doing in your life as you've been sitting there and just drinking of the word the last few weeks and months. God is restoring what the years and the canker worm and the palmer worm and situations and betrayal and people lying on you. All those situations God is now turning around because you have said, I understand who the enemy is now. I understand who the enemy is now. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for life. This is the day that you have made, and we rejoice. And we are glad in it. God, we thank you for pastor's birthday. We thank you for the spirit of celebration today the spirit of giving, the spirit of joy, unity, love, family, all the things, oh my God, that are part of being a part of the family of God. I thank you that you love us enough not to leave us the way that we are. And God, I thank you for this church that stands for discipleship. I thank you for the people that are under the sound of my voice that the spirit of the living God is dealing with even now. I thank you that we're moving forward, that your kingdom is advancing in our lives let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven god give us daily bread today forgive us our debts forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned and have debts with us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for the evil one is here and wanting to attack but we ask that you would deliver us for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. People, people of God, before we dismiss, that the Spirit of God had me pacing, and I'm not going to labor the time, but I'm instructed by the Holy Ghost because you get one shot with people, and the man of God had to condense he had to condense pull back and hold back his flow because of time this is what I want to say to the people that's remaining even if you have been on an encounter with men, women and even children there are some open doors visualize when you go into a door it opens or if you walk up to the door, you can open it. Or if you walk up to the door, it automatically open. Doors represents access. The title of the sermon was Stop the Flow. In order for something to flow, it got to have a continuing, continuance, a continuance, a continuance, a continuance to have a flow. If not, it'd be what the Bible calls going into the Dead Sea. Out, no outflow, no outflow. Follow me, no follow me, follow me, no follow me. No outflow. In many of our lives, I know this is not all. There's many men, especially men. Especially men because we got so much, oh my God, stuff inside of our mind that has happened to us. As well as women, but has happened to us. And we have doors that are open. In our belief system. Because everything starts with the mind. The Bible says it's with the mind that you and I serve God. So if your mind is off, guess what your life going to be? Off. And so we have doors. That's open. Long as you keep the doors open. 
that's for your perception that's dealing with your self image that's dealing with your self esteem that's not letting go of stuff my God that's giving the enemy my God access to your life as long as you keep the doors open as long as you don't confront nor deal with nor confess John 1 9 my God the stuff that's giving the enemy legal access let me give you some kingdom thought now we give the enemy legal access to come in and out of our life because what we won't do even though we know we should do it now I know my God oh my God I know that there's more people in this church that got many 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 doors open and enemies coming in and out in and out in and out because the doors is not closed long as you are broken long as you are wounded long as you won't confront my God I challenge yourself my God oh my God to close the doors the enemy gonna come in and then we're going to come out. And that's why we come to church every Sunday. We come to church every Wednesday, even if you're looking online. And nothing is changing. You know why? Because the enemy has a flow. We have not shut the door on the enemy. We think, my God, the enemy is another human being. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, my God. See, the enemy wants you and I to think that, that, that the enemy is that person. But it's the spirit behind the person. And as the pastor just said, my God, many of us got people in our life, my God, that the enemy has strategically put there, my God, and they're an enemy to your future. They're an enemy to your purpose. They're an enemy to your healthiness. And you let them stay there. You know who they are, but you won't clip. You won't clip. One more time. If you got some doors open. Guess what the doors is? Your soul. Guess what the enemy come to torment? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. So if your soul is wounded in any capacity, there are some things, there are some people, there are some places, my God, there are some things that's going on in your life that's open to the enemy. Why don't you come so we can pray over you? Don't leave yourself the way you walked in there. You know. There's wounds, there's scars, there's doors that you are giving the enemy legal access to your life. Be it rejection, be it abandonment. Come on, sir. Come on, some of us is angry at the former wives, the former husband. My God, we bitter at our children. My God, we got so much pain. We haven't been affirmed in our lives. Come on, somebody. My God, we've been dropped like Mephibosheth. My God, we, we struggle with our belief system. My God, oh my God, we compromise in our lives. We got a lot of compromise in our lives. It means we let stuff go on in our lives that we know it's not godly but we justify unforgiveness is a door that the enemy will continually use to bombard your mind hatred 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 of people hatred of, 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 of yourself my God is another door that the enemy will use to torment you the rest of the days of your life mm. My God, bitterness and jealousy and greed, idolatry, those high things, my God, idolatry. My God, idolatry leads to adultery. And many of us is, my God, committing adultery on Christ. That means you love Christ, but you love the world. Read the book of James. That's called adultery. You might not be blind, committing adultery with your wife or your husband, but you're committing adultery on God because you love the world just as more as you love God. You don't read. You come to church, but you're in love with the world. Your desires and your passions, my God, is all about the world. That's a form of idolatry adultery that's Bible God's coming for that that's an open door some of them I got our God is money greed and we tell ourselves men we got to get it we got to get it I got to take care of my family everything is on me but you don't read you don't pray you don't thank God my God for giving you the strength the wisdom all the knowledge my God to get you to, to go to work but your, 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 your passion and your pursuit is money hiding behind a form of religion that's how we tell ourselves, I got to get it. But you, but, but, but you worship the money and got to get it more than you worship the God who give you the power to obtain wealth. That's Bible. See, that's, that's barricaded up under all that stuff in the house that got to be renovated. Some of us, our God is money. It's the pursuit, my God, of trying to obtain everything that the world has to offer. That's a God. That's a high place. That's the type of stuff that God is after of today. I couldn't let you go, my God, without giving you an opportunity to make right what's still in them high places. Wounds and scars. Frustration. Many of you, my God, has been physically abused by loved ones. And you are angry at that person for beating you. 
whooping you with stitcher cords, locking you in your closets and stuff. Oh my God, my God. Oh my God. My, oh my God. Which, which, which caused a form of abandonment and rejection. My God, thank you, Lord. Some of you feel neglected by your own parents, even though you're in the house with them, my God. But they pay you no mind. They pay you no attention. That's a form of rejection. That's a form of abandonment. Oh, my God, you got to deal with that stuff. Last call. What doors are open? Where is the enemy getting in at? How about our belief system? Our perception about God is shifting. We call it right, wrong now. We are justifying, oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. We are justifying sinful activity. We have accepted living together with men and women that's not our husband and stuff like that. That's an open door that the enemy will use to torment you the rest of your days. It's unacceptable. We are compromised. We tell ourselves we're not qualified. You are qualified because God said you are qualified. So, Father God, I thank you now as the people has responded thank God for Pastor Dean and I know he can diss pull back and hell back Father God but this is a very prophetic word to the church who at 205 as well Father God those online and those to the nation we have to stop the flow of the enemy because the enemy is trying to de-kill us Lord who my God so Father God we come today who my God all those Father God that was already at the altar and all those that came down oh my God they have stepped out Father God and they saying it's me I got open doors. I need to close the door to the enemy. I need to stop the flow my, of the enemy in my life. So, Father God, as we prepare to come before you, oh, as Pastor Jeff told us, Father God, stone number one is to show up. And the people of God all over, Father God, this sanctuary has showed up, Father God. And now, Father God, we get out of the way and we allow your presence, which is your spirit, Father God, to get in the way. Now go up into the attic of the minds of the people of God. Those that are still in their seats and those that are at the altar. And start the process, Father God, of renovation. In the name of Jesus, Father God. Help us, Father God. Oh, my God. To close. Oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. Close. Close the flow. Show us, Father God. Show us by the Spirit. Where the enemy is coming in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Show us what door that we need to close and we need to bolt. Father God, as I speak this prophetically, Father God, also those doors represent. Oh my God, Lord, help me, Holy Ghost. Those doors, those doors, men, especially my daughters in the spirit. Those doors represent, you know what? Close your doors. Close your doors. Close your doors close your doors that's the where the enemy is getting you the most right there you feel like you got to keep that door open so you can feel a part of something so you can feel like he love you you feel my guy tell you if you ain't doing that my god then you don't you don't think he love you if you don't keep your doors open if you don't compromise my god and allow him to mishandle you and abuse your body my god you feel like my god you're gonna lose him yeah you, you, you feel like you can't make it without him because he helped give you a little money at the end of the month and he'll pay your car payment on your cell phone bill and you keep your doors open you you feel raped you feel molested my god you feel my god so less than shame and guilt because you are ah, exposing father god a place that only god who has said is preserved for a husband and his wife mm. close the door close the door close the door close the door close the door, close the door. Close the door. Close the door. Father, I thank you now. Empower the people, Father God, to give to make the decision to close those doors. They know why they responded. They know why they came. And those that's sitting that chose not to come, Father God, give them the strength, Father God, to cut away. Who am I got to clip, Father God, and cut away and clip, Father God, and cut away. Give them shields and weapons, Father God, to defeat the enemy that's coming in and out of their lives, Father God. In the name of Jesus, I bind every witch, I bind every warlock, and I speak death to every high principality father in the name of Jesus mm. who freedom we decree and we declare freedom we decree and declare strength to close the doors this day Lord we make a decision to close the doors we confess first John 1 and 9 we confess that we fall short and we ask that you forgive us for all of our sins and God, according to your word, you are faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. Cleanse the sons and daughters. Cleanse the people of God. Cleanse us. 
in the name of Jesus. Give us the strength for the journey. It's not by their might nor by their power, but it's by your spirit. Restoration has come. No more shame. Listen to me, Lord. No more shame, y'all. No more guilt. No more condemnations. The shame that you feel, you will only feel it if you keep the doors open. The condemnation, my God, that you may be struggling with, you will only experience it if you keep the doors open. You have come, now close them. But you don't understand, Pastor. No, I don't, but God does. And God has given you the spirit to be able to close every door that the enemy has given, that you have given the enemy access. We thank you, Lord. Now, as we leave this place, Father God, we go in peace. Thank you for all the internal healing that has taken place. Thank you for the month, giving God the glory, the month of September, and all the men's, women's, and children encounters, Father God. We thank you that you have renovated us. Now, help us to go so that the enemy, my God, who, my God, won't bring seven more demons, Father God. Help us to protect the deliverance. Help us to protect the, 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 the healing. Help us to protect, Father God, our identity. Help us to protect, Father God, what you've done. This weekend, this month, Father God, in the month of September, during the encounter month, Lord. Thank you for the people in God. Bless them as I release them. Thank you, Father God, for each one of them. In Jesus' holy, precious name, we pray. Come on and say amen.